Well, I think first of all you should care because it does directly impact you. It impacts everyone in Minnesota. But the two topics I want to talk about quickly uh, are the court's budget and the importance of preserving a fair and impartial judiciary. Both of those challenges will be coming up before the legislative session. So I do speak with a, uh, a strong voice to the legislative body that uh, is here today. Uh, we turn first to the budget. Uh, at the outset, I think it's important to observe that the judiciary is one of three co-equal branches of government that we are a core government function, that it is essential, essential to the pro, pro, proper functioning of a, the government as a whole, that the judiciary be proper, properly funded. Uh, the budget of the judiciary is roughly um, 300 million annually, or for the biennium, about 600 million which is about 2% of the state's budget. The vast majority of that money, 85%, goes to personnel. Uh, by all objective measures, we have run a lean operation. And let me just talk to you about that for a minute. Over the last five years, the, legis or the judiciary has continued to suffer uh, cuts. Uh, we are now at the point where we have uh, instituted a hiring freeze. We have, uh, if you look at the real numbers, there's been some consolidations and so forth, but we have law, uh, we, through furloughs, through not replacing positions, we're down about 300 positions over the last five years. That's roughly 10% of our employees. Uh, those are the people that we rely upon to, uh, to make the business work. Uh, we have, as a result of that short staffing, had to close public counters for the district courts across the state for about uh, a half a day per week just to uh, maintain. In the 8th district, all employees have agreed to cut uh, their hours from 40 to about 37 hours, which is about a 6% reduction on top of that 10 percent that we talked about. We have, with respect to judicial vacancies, whenever a judge resigns or dies, we have held those positions open for a minimum of four months before we certify the vacancy that then uh, goes to judicial selection for appointment by the governor. So for example, in Duluth there was a position where the uh, person retired the new, and that was roughly the end of uh, the year, gosh, it's been two years ago now, and that person, uh, uh, now Judge John DeSanto, was announced in February but did not begin to serve his position until July. So that court was short-staffed that judge. Uh, so we've done uh, all those cuts We've also, uh, it was interesting to hear about the uh, technology. We've redoubled our efforts to find court process efficiencies to expand the use of technology to reduce costs. Uh, we're centralizing payables. Uh, over the next two years, we hope to uh, roll out a court payment center concept over all 85 counties to handle the one million plus traffic citations that are part of our work, uh, uh, and that will uh, free up the employees to do other things. It will also improve our ability on collections, and it hopefully, we, we believe, will result in uh, overall some 17 to 19 million dollars in more revenue just by doing that process. Now, in order to do that, you need people to help set up the system. In order to set up the system, you need money to do that. Uh, if we have cuts, we're not able to do those types of things. So uh, we are doing everything we can to cut costs, to make our system better, to build a better mousetrap, uh, if you will. Uh, the uh, 
consequence of further cuts to what we have now will result in the ju judiciary not being able to carry out its constitutional mandate. Uh, we simply won't be able to process the cases that we have. Uh, that would be, I think, uh, uh, a problem that of significant ramifications from two perspectives. One, according to our state constitution, the object of government is to provide for the security, benefit, and protection of people, and without adequate funding, uh, our government, will, our courts, will be unable to discharge that obligation. Uh, secondly, it will have a disproportionate impact on the business community. And by that I mean of the cases that we process every year, uh, the criminal cases, the felony cases, for example, are subject to the Speedy Trial Act. So those cases have to, they have priority. We have child protection cases where placement of a child in a home, those cases have priority. We simply, if we have cuts, more cuts, are not going to be able to handle all these cases, so we have to prioritize, as Representative Smith indicated. In this case, we have to make tough decisions. We have 51 different types of cases. Some cases will have to go forward because of a constitutional or statutory mandate. Others will go to the back of the line because we simply don't have the resources guess which cases are going to end up going to the back of the line? The civil cases, the civil cases. We, we just don't have the resources and that will slow down. We will have backlogs. You will have uh, the kind of cases where you file a case and it isn't se it's several years before that case gets to trial. We also will have problems with criminal cases. Uh, in Olmstead County, they are, they are now calendaring misdemeanor trials one year in the future. So if you live in Rochester and you get a traffic ticket, you won't go to court until December of 2010. Uh, similar delays are being experienced across the state. Now, you could say, well, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> go wait a year. But for those cases that matter, it's not such a good thing. Uh, and what I point out is this, last year the Court of Appeals overturned two felony convictions and dismissed the charges against the defendant because of the failure to provide for a speedy trial. Now we are all concerned about safety. This is an issue that impacts us, not just a little bit, but a lot. Uh, the old uh, maxim, justice delayed is justice denied, applies. Uh, let me cover, uh, Preserving a fair and impartial judiciary. Uh, I see I'm going to be running out of time here, but let me go as quickly as I can. Uh, let me explain Minnesota's system and why there uh, is an issue as it relates to preserving a fair and impartial judiciary, particularly as it relates to judicial elections. In Minnesota, by constitution, judge must be uh, learned in the law and shall be elected by voters in the area in which they serve. Usually the way this happens is a vacancy occurs and the, when a judge retires, that position is certified, the governor appoints a replacement. Uh, that happens in roughly 90% or by far the, away the majority of the cases. Uh, what happens and has uh, happened over the last 100 years is a judge is appointed, a judge then serves for a couple of years because of our general election cycle and then stands for election. The election process is uh, essentially has been a referendum on the performance of that incumbent judge. Thus, the election process provides judicial accountability to Minnesota voters. Uh, we've used it that way for over a century. It has worked very well. We've done three things to keep politics out of judicial elections. Uh, the legislature has uh, promulgated a law that says when a judge runs, the incumbent judge has their name and after their name it says comma incumbent. And that's by law. The other parties cannot list uh, uh, political party affiliations and that's to keep politics out of judicial elections. 